We're live. You're listening to Neurodivergent Mates. Hello and welcome to another episode of Neurodivergent Mates. My name's Will Wheeler and today I've got a special guest all the way from Toronto in Canada, Jessica McGann, to talk to us about coming to understanding my neurodivergence. Jessica, what's going on, my friend? Oh, you know, just wrapped off of a day of work here in Toronto. It's Friday night, so ready to dive into some fun conversations with you before kicking off the weekend. Well, what are you doing? So are you going out tonight? Am I going out? I'm meeting up with some friends. Yeah. Nice. Nice. What, 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 like, are you going somewhere? Are you going to someone's house? What's the Yeah, deal? we're just meeting up at a friend's house and <laughs> chit-chatting. Very casual. I'm definitely not hitting the clubs or the bars like I used to in my younger years. Just yeah. chill and relax and more yeah. socializing. It's so funny. As you get older, it's like, that is our club. Just going to our mate's house and having a few drinks. Or when you get even older, it's like just sitting at home and having a drink on your own is um, that's equivalent to that then, you know. But, I have um, definitely noticed as I get older, I'm much more uh, content with being on my own. Like a night mm. in by myself, just cozied up with a movie, like sold. It, it was so funny, right? Because um, I saw I saw a picture um, of someone like it's like a meme, and it was this picture of someone sleeping, and it says "my way of saving money these days." <laughs> and I'm like, "Yes, true. You know, I should be sleeping more. You know, yes." But um, staying in is a great way to do that. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Or trying to find ways to be able to. Um, to save money, like watch Netflix or, or whatever that is. But uh, we should really get stuck into this. So what we'll do just before we do start, I'll, I'll get uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. So if you haven't checked us out before, please subscribe, like, and follow to all of our social media pages. We're available on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, X, Twitch, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And please check us out at wherever you listen to your podcasting platforms. Um, you can check us out there. Please subscribe to us, rate the show. The more you do, the better for the algorithm it is. Also, if you haven't already done so, please check out the work we're doing at neurodiversityacademy.com. Um, we'd really appreciate your support. Also, um, just a little bit of a warning. Some discussions we uh, may be triggering. If you need help, please reach out to a loved one or call emergency services we are not doctors. This is a space for sharing experience and strategies. And if you have any questions during the podcast, please pop it into the live session, which we're currently on at the moment. And if it's a good question, we'll uh, throw it up. What do you reckon, Jess? Yeah, happy to take uh, some answers from the from the viewers. From the viewers. Like. Hopefully we get some people through. Sometimes we do. We've had some people go, man, I'm sitting on a train listening to you. It's morning wherever we are. Aww. And it's like, yeah, cool, you know, <laughs> but um, but awesome stuff. You know what? Let, let's get stuck into this because this isn't about me. This is about you. You know, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, you're from Toronto, but let, yeah. the, let the viewers know a little bit more about what who you are. Gosh, I feel like that question is always such a difficult question. And as you get older, it's like my personality and who I am and how I define myself is just ever changing and evolving. But on like a on a surface basic level for the purposes of this, um, I'm a coach. I work with creative professionals who are in film and television on stress management and their own mental well-being while working in such a crazy industry. Um, I'm a TV producer myself. I work in unscripted um, television. So that's competition series. You might have seen some of them like All Round Champion, Blown Away, uh, Big Brother Canada. Currently, I'm doing a Discovery show. So that's really fun. So are these like reality TV shows type of thing? So unscripted, is that what you mean by unscripted? Yes, unscripted meaning uh, reality shows. But I'd like to clarify for anyone watching, I don't do, I've never done a reality uh, show like um, 
the Jersey Kardashians. Shore or something. Something oh, that's like okay. personality based where or like housewives where it's mm. about relationships. The shows mm. I produce are more so competition based where there's like stakes built in. So can uh, I ask, can I ask with those, right? So I had a friend of mine who was doing the big brother here in Australia, nice. right? Yeah. And he was saying that what you do see on TV is completely different to what's actually going on. So sometimes producers may try and get certain things started, but they may film certain parts and then they'll use that part to look as if it's something different. Is Mm -hmm. that correct? Like, say, for example, we might see someone have an argument, but it's really got nothing to do with what they're they're framing it as show if that makes sense I'm sure that does take place like I know that has happened but I don't think it's applicable to the type of shows that I work on in the sense Mm. that there is built-in stakes people Mm. are in a competition typically Mm. in my world aiming to achieve something or win something those stakes are already high we don't really need to fabricate drama in those areas Mm. but for those personality shows they'll do something called a Franken edit where they will splice things. They'll take things as small as what? And cut it into other. Oh, other really? So you cut your words into pieces. So uh, that would be called Franken editing. But things like Big Brother Canada or competition shows, oftentimes that's not even necessary. The drama is real. It's happening. And nothing mm. needs to be fabricated because the stakes are actually there. Does that make it easier for you? You know, for my uh, morality, I think it does. Mm. Like, I don't know if I could produce a show that is preying on people's mental unwellness or Mm. um, pain to create drama. I like producing shows where it's there. Like, I don't Mm. need to manipulate people. I'd rather support people on the journey than try and... Yeah, do you do you guys have um so we have a show here in Australia called Married at First Sight? Oh do you, yeah. do, you, do you have that? We don't have that show, but I've watched your show of it. Oh Absolutely. really? It's oh my, like oh my god, it's the biggest load of rubbish I've ever watched. <laughs> like such good rubbish. Such yeah, good. but but you can just like tell that the producers have gone in there and said, look. What we want to do, we want to make some drama. So we want this to happen and we want this. And it just seems so fake. Uh, sometimes if a show is overly produced, you can tell. That's where you get like the ick. When you feel like I found um, Love Island USA this past season. It was mm-hmm so fascinating to watch as an audience because there was so much drama, but Mm. you could tell that those producers were working their butts off to create Mm. that drama with how they were producing those competitions, how they were producing those conversations or those dates. It was really aggressive producing. And from my point of view, at least. Wow. And would you say like with say your coaching and all of that, Mm -hmm. with say some of these producers, it is high stake type of work because You've got to produce numbers, so it's stressful. There's so much money involved. There's so much stress and pressure involved. I mean, most film and TV workers are freelancers to start, Mm -hmm. and the industry has just not been doing its best. Uh, It's really struggling right now, so a lot of people are feeling extensive amounts of time unemployed, financial stress, but then also when you're on a show and the deadlines are tight and the money is high. There's just a lot of pressure. So I really struggled with navigating it when I first entered. And so teaching people the skills that I learned that have made this industry so much more sustainable just from Mm. these life skills is just one of my passions for sure. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I think, I think it's, and you know, you know, I often think about say child stars, you Mm. know, these kids are coming into this industry and we often see these child stars really struggling later in life type of thing because, you know, what is in place for these people? It just seems to be money, money, money. Yeah, no, you don't work for this anymore. See you later type of thing. But it's also, you know, who's supporting them, um, who's there to be by their sides and take care of them. (laughs) Mm. And yeah, they're put into an adult workspace. 
at such a young mm. age. And then if you're on camera and you're getting the judgments and opinions of strangers from all over the world, that's going to affect you for sure. I mean, most recently we saw, I think his name was Liam from One Direction just recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was actually about Today. to mention yeah. that. You know. Yeah, um... Addiction and stress, like they're prevalent in these industries. If we do not have coping mechanisms that we can lean on, um, that are healthy, we will lean to those unhealthy skills like drugs and alcohols because they numb us. They make us feel better immediately. So a lot of film and TV workers are very susceptible to that path because you need quick fixes because oftentimes your days are long, your recovery time is short, and the pressure is surmountable. So those are really easy things. And that's kind of what I have no idea about this young gentleman's life or pressures or anything but it sounds like there were drugs and alcohol involved in this event and i can only imagine the mental space well he, well it's interesting we're talking about this because he's actually he was adhd as well so mm -hmm. you know yeah so there's a a lot of like, who knows was he still on it you know from what oh. i from what i've heard and i don't know the full picture but yeah. like I think he was very heavily intoxicated on something. I don't know if that's yeah. some type of drugs. So if you're on certain ADHD medication and mixing it with a whole bunch of other stuff, um, with a whole bunch of other things going on as well, it's a recipe for disaster right there. Oh, see, well, I know we'll probably get to this later, but I just <laughs> recently started ADHD medicine. And I have um, no, like, is it bad to mix it with alcohol or Drugs. Oh, I have no idea. Oh, I don't need. <laughs> yeah, I don't need. I, I wish. Look, I, I think there's probably something. And look, obviously, I'm no expert on this, but I think that's definitely something you'd need to talk yeah. to your doctor about. Totally. Um, you know, and say that they'll probably say within moderation. Um, but you know, well, it's, it's different because like it's not like an antibiotic. It's a long term kind of medicine. Mm -hmm. Wasn't flagged to me, but um, mm -hmm. it's actually. Well, we'll get to it later, but uh... yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that it, it is interesting. It, it, it is interesting. But um, I was going to say, um, tell us a little bit about the work you do, but you've already sort of spoken about it, bit, so I don't yeah. think we'll go go into that. But you know, like we said, you know, when you when I reached out to you, I said, hey, look, what do you want to reach about uh, talk about? And you said a big thing you want to talk about is you know, especially struggles through school all of that mm. type of stuff so what was it like growing up and struggling in school so did you want to share with the audience like maybe some so obviously you're your ADHD and there were yeah. some learning difficulties on top of that as well yeah. so I was diagnosed earlier on in my life my parents uh, my father's a social worker my mother is just brilliant in her own right and so they were very pro proactive about getting me and my brother tested when we were younger. And so around 12, I was diagnosed with a variety of learning difficulties, which basically in summary, um, I have trouble processing information. It takes me about double to three times the amount of time of a normal person mm. to understand information, especially if it's written, it's really mm. hard for me to process. Um, and I have short term memory issues. So quick little things I can often not retain. And, um, and I was diagnosed with ADHD. And so mm -hmm. what this meant for me in school was um, I was put into kind of like a special ed type of class where I got some additional support. And the teachers that I worked with also had a connection to that information. Mm -hmm. And I was bullied severely growing up. Like I almost dropped out of high school. I was bullied extensively in elementary school. I think because I had so much energy and, you know, that ADHD, like just constantly jumping around, talking about a million different things. Oh, shut, shut up, Jessica. You're too Did loud. You get, you talk yeah. too much. Your energy is mm. too high, just overwhelming um, mm, to mm. most people. But then this was before I feel like now our conversations around mental health and mental well-being are more progressive. And we're, we're talking about going to therapy and how we can support each other. And at that time, when I was in high school, I'm 34 now. So this is like 15 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my teachers were intolerant to it. They were impatient mm -hmm. with it. And mm -hmm. I actually had a teacher um, in science, I believe it's grade nine or 10. It was day one of the class. And he put his hand on my desk. And he said, you don't belong in my class. <laughs> 
And for so long, you know, my diagnosis meant that I should take a, in Canada, there's applied and academic applied gets you to college. Academic gets you to to university. And I wanted, I wanted to go to university. I wanted that option. So I was taking academic classes. And so this mm-hmm. science teacher was like, you need to go down to applied. And I was like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to university. I don't care mm-hmm. if this is hard. I'm doing it. And mm-hmm. um, he was, he treated me so poorly that I ended up having to like bring him to the principal's office with the support of my special ed teachers. And it was like a whole thing. But I felt like so much of the adults that I was looking to, to support or guide me in uh, how differently my brain worked and how differently I needed to learn things. And they just didn't have that capacity. And- I, I, it's funny that you share that because, you know, I had similar experiences. Not that I was like, yeah, I'm going to uni. I knew I wasn't going to get into uni. I probably could now. but um- I would like to mention that I did <laughs> pass all my academic classes and I got in early acceptance to my first choice university. I did there you go. College, Congratulations. I freaking did it. Screw everyone yeah. as I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. You know, but I think, you know, looking back at, you know, my experience and hearing your experience as yeah. well, so interesting that it's like it's not just an Australian thing. It's a, It happens worldwide. I sometimes feel that when there's people like us who, yeah, we learn differently, yeah, there might be a little bit more work involved, it's like we're a pain in the ass to these people because they have to put – it's burdening them to to go away from what they normally do to mm-hmm. doing these little extra things to help people like us. But it's like, dude, that's your job. You know yeah, what and I mean? I feel and for teachers. The like they, they do have an incredibly difficult job. Their classroom totally. sizes are huge and they have to be able to care for the variety of students that are within mm-hmm. their care. But I think just in general, I used to make it mean that something was wrong mm-hmm. with me. When really we need to recognize that the world and our systems were built and developed to support kind of one type of person Mm -hmm. and one kind of mind. And when you don't fit into that picture, then it's really difficult for you. You you meet someone who has a physical disability and they will tell you how much the world was not designed for them. But it's Mm -hmm. not their fault. It's just that our systems are outdated and they're not to meet the standards of everybody. And we just need to continue to try and understand other people's experiences and evolve our systems into one that is going to be more inclusive to the variety of minds and bodies that exist in this world. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because um, when I was in school, I had some teachers who were great and I did really well in those classes. So it's almost like, but but it was so funny because some of those teachers were frowned upon by other teachers because of their their teaching styles and all of that. And it yeah. was like, I don't know if it was because those teachers were making the other ones look bad. Um, I don't know. But um, when I did have a good teacher who would, I suppose, respect me and I gave them the same respect. But, but you know, there was some times where I'd be with some teachers who, really respected me and I, I would misbehave and they'd be like, look, Will, can you stay back? I was like, Will, what are you doing? Like, come on, man. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, don't give you me know, such a hard time. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. And they're just sort of like, yeah, no, I can't be bad with this person because they're, they're cool, you know? Yeah. So a good um, teacher can make a world of a difference. Oh, it, it, it does. It does. And, and you know what, right? I think that it flows well in yeah. to this next part here so you know what effect has that had on you so maybe your experience at school there with your teachers and being bullied by people how has that affected you but you know maybe that's affected you in a positive way now that you're able to look beyond that you're able to get into university you've got a really really interesting job you know so how has that affected you to where you are now a couple of things I want to say in that regard. And and one is that I embrace my ADHD now. I think it is um, one of the greatest gifts that I have um, for a variety of ways. But the thing that I think really stuck with me and what really affected me of growing up with that is I felt that I was stupid for very much of my life. And I genuinely, I think I've only been able to shift that within the past, like, four months, genuinely 
in the past four months, I finally started to, to believe that I'm actually smart. But for the m- longest time, I just saw myself as stupid. And it was a very strong narrative that I was fed. And it was really from that early age beginning of, you know, I struggled with spelling. So kids at school call me things like Jesse McCant spell. Or, you know, teachers telling me that I'm too dumb to be in their classes and I need to be taking applied classes. And I, you know, you can't go to university. You know, I just felt like, or my energy was so high and I'm such a bubbly and positive person. I have so much joy with me that I think people perceive that as naivety or stupidity when it was just joy. And I really carried those narratives with me for such a long time. They were very deep ingrained with me. And I'm, I'm really grateful that through all my work and consistency of showing up for myself and doing things like, oh, you, you want me to take apply classes because that's what the paperwork says. No, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for me. And I don't care if it's harder. And I'm grateful that I've had that tenacity throughout my life, even with this narrative. But I think, yeah, that story of telling myself I'm stupid has been one of my hardest hurdles to overcome. And I'm grateful Mm. that I've yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I think it was, you know, for me growing up, it was it was weird because, like, yeah, I was struggling in school, failing big time. But when I was doing other stuff, um, like some sport or art or, or whatever, I was excelling, you know. And yeah, I think as, yeah, and I think as well, like, and I always was like, um, and it's been really funny because you know I, because I was struggling in school, I had a, I I doubted myself a lot, and it's really funny. I speak to a lot of people that, or a lot of people I used to go to school with, listen to the podcast, mm. and they get in contact with me, and they're like, "Oh, Will, um, man, um, it's so strange that you didn't have much confidence in school because I didn't see you like that at all. I thought you were like the cool, popular guy." And for me, I was like, what? That's not what I was thinking. But, you know, I think now that I look at that, because those are skills, right? Because I I see them as skills. And especially now going into business, building connections, um, putting myself out there, I'm noticing that those are key skills that I've always had and just come naturally type of thing. So. Um, it's sort of, you know, back then I was sort of like, it was, it was more confusing because I did see this really great side to myself, but then I was failing miserably. And it's sort of like, now I look at it like, oh, wow, I have these great skills and yeah, I failed miserably here, but I don't know. It it, it was just really confusing for me back in the day. It's interesting that you mention um, kind of people observing you as this outgoing, uh, Mm. vibrant, confident person when you didn't necessarily feel that yourself. Because Mm. I think there is, there's something about that H, that hyperactivity where we can be so open Mm. um, and not see it in the same way that other people do. So it doesn't feel vulnerable in a sense. It just feels very natural. Well, I didn't know I was like ADHD until yeah. like a few years ago. So oh, yeah. it it's was like, crazy. yeah, yeah, totally. And it was just, I suppose it was a bit of a game changer when I realized it, but it was a lot, bit of an aha moment, mm. if that makes sense as well. Ooh. Hey, out of, curios- out of curiosity, right? Yeah. You said that it's only been the last, I don't know, couple of years or months or something like that, that you don't feel the way you used to feel like Mm -hmm. you said you felt stupid or whatever Mm -hmm. what 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 was the the change or what what was that trigger that made you go actually you know what I am pretty awesome um I have been doing a lot of mental health work over the past Mm -hmm. couple of years Mm -hmm. so I've been um in uh 2020 One, I went back to school and got a diploma in life coaching where I learned a lot of like reframing thoughts and uh, stress management and motion nervous system regulation. And um, that, you know, has been great. But it wasn't until this year when honestly, my whole world kind of collapsed in on itself. Mm. In January, I separated with my 
from my partner of four years. I lost my home. I lost my dog. I had to move into a whole new apartment. I was unemployed for six months. Like mm. it felt so much like the world was, was just crumbling against yeah. me. And it called upon me to show the F up. Like mm. I either could sit in my misery and go, woe is me. Or I could believe in myself and 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 trust in myself and show the F up. And mm. how I showed up for myself in that moment and through the work, I got hired on a job that has me producing at a level that I've never done before and I'm excelling at it. And it's just kind of now landed at me through coming overcoming that difficult moment. And I think with a mix of those skills that I'm finally like, I'm amazing. I'm actually, I'm, I'm amazing. <laughs> like, like, like that just through realization of like, people were wrong. I am smart and it might not be smart. Like I can do math and I can do science, but I can connect with people and I can tell stories and I can, mm. I can reach out to a billion pe people and I can receive a bunch of no's and that's not going to stop me. And people disbelieving in me is not going to prevent me from showing up for myself and as I continue to coach and I continue to work with other people on their mental well-being, I'm really starting to understand how a lot of people do not have those skills. And that's intelligence. Emotional intelligence is valid and it's important. And it's it's a skill and an intelligence that is valued. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's it's and you, it's something you can't go and be taught. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like it's a natural. I think some of our personalities and the way that we can connect a lot of the time. And it's really funny when I meet a lot of ADHDers who may not even know that they're ADHD or or whatever. Yeah. I'll meet them and I'll be like, "Pretty sure this person's ADHD <laughs> just yeah. through the the way they're able to connect." And, and and things like that so mm. it's um it's interesting how it um it sort of evolves there if, if that makes sense you know really yeah though I would push back I would argue with you that emotional mm. intelligence can be taught but I think for others it comes naturally mm. but they are mm. skills and how we listen and how mm. we empathize and like those are skills you can learn so if anyone is listening and maybe you don't present as neurodivergent or you feel like you lack in those skills. I do believe they are things that you can learn and practice. Just like if I really wanted to do math, mm. I could learn it. It's going to be harder for me because I don't naturally have that brain, but I could learn it. And I don't know, think I could be harder for others, but you can learn it. I don't think I could be asked learning math now. <laughs> way. I'd be like, the most stop of my life. <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like seriously, like I honestly... I, I don't know what it was like over in Canada, but like doing stuff like pi or long division, you know, I could, not, I could not tell you the last time I've needed to use long division. No. Like where the, where the hell do you use that shit? You know <laughs> what I mean? Those are for so, the scientists. Those are for the mathematicians. You guys take it away. Teach me how to, why are we not teaching me how to do taxes? That's what yeah, I want. Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. You know, and, and I, I reckon this day and age, they should even have like um, in schools, like um, uh, running your uh, uh, your own business courses. Yeah. You know, I learning mean, about yeah, learning I about agree. certain programs that you would be using if you're running a business, because especially say a lot of neurodivergent people um, could go into a. a we often see it a lot. A lot of neurodivergent people are running their own businesses. It could be that you become a carpenter. So you need yeah. to start, you know what I mean? Or you're a plumber or you're whatever, you know? Yeah. But we do see a lot of people in those types of things. It's like, you know, and probably if they had have had that, I probably would have done a little course. Like it would have been interesting to me Ooh. that, you know, talking about, networking and all of that why aren't schools doing that so maybe some schools do because i i know here in australia that some of them do like uh certificates like oh yeah and yeah they're so they're able to get like a certificate three in business or two in business okay. or or whatever like that i'm not sure what happens over in canada 
Well, I mean, I don't have any kids and it's been a while since I've been in school. So I don't know how much the programs have developed, but yeah, I mean, I don't even think I knew that starting my own business was even an option when I was, you know, in high school. So even to have that seed planted at that time would be, I think, a beautiful, uh, contribution for schools. And then also like grant writing, teaching people how to write a grant and apply for money and funds and understanding like you can get support in starting those businesses in that kind of way. Yeah. That's sort of a fun type of way of really, I would be, I would have been interested in that type of, and especially with like technology, like, and this is the thing, technology is the game changer for for me from what I've found. You know, uh, the tech that's around today just wasn't there when I was a kid. Right? Oh, my school, gosh. I didn't right? even have, like, uh, we didn't, I didn't have uh, social media. Oh, like, no, my that was could only call and text. That was it. That like, I well, well, we, 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 <laughs> well, the thing that our, my phone, my, so I was in the era where phones became, like, accessible for everyone. You know, I remember yeah. back when I was very young, my dad would have like a car phone and you could take it out of the car and put it into oh. like a bag and then walk <laughs> around the streets on like a phone type of thing. Yeah. Um, and then you got like the, but those were expensive. That was like, I think like thousands of dollars for that phone, right? And then you would get like the big bricks. They were yeah. quite expensive. And then you got the small little prepaid things that were cheap as everyone had phones then but then you could play snake remember snake oh, yeah. and the little oh, games yeah. you could play yeah what yeah did yeah yeah did you for work what's up what did your father do for work if well honest? he owned his own business yeah this is i saw an interesting um video uh about you know everyone these days is just so stressed we're so high strung mm-hmm. we're feeling burnt out we're feeling exhausted and I think a lot of that has to do with now we have people are so easy to access us. We mm. have these phones that are on us at all time. Work can ping you with a bunch of emails. They can call you. There's not as much escape. And in comparison to when your father had those phones mm. back in the day, when you left work, it was like you were done. There was no mm. reaching you afterwards. It was mm. only the people with the high paying jobs and those stressful jobs that had those phones. Mm. Now everyone does. It doesn't matter if you work at McDonald's making $12 an hour if work wants to reach you, like you can have that access. And that, I think that's raising the stress levels because people feel like they can't turn off uh, it, like they used to. Well, you know what? Like, I don't know as a kid, so as a kid here in Australia, right. So we, our bikes, right. That was our transport. And the, the amount of like K's we did on our bikes was just unbelievable. I wish I could do the amount of K's on a bike these days. I'd be so fit, right? <laughs> but like, but like back in the day, you know, we didn't have phones. Our parents would, would be like, hey mom, just going out with yep. Brandon or whatever. And we'd be gone for like the whole day. Do you and know what like, I mean? Come home when the street lights turn on. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like if you we weren't home by a certain time, your mom would come out like searching for you, right? Yep. But like, you know. If you did that these days, if you said to your kid, oh, yeah, just go out and they did have a phone or something like that, you'd be freaking out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, crazy times, crazy times. Now, um, we will go into – so I think you sort of said you were diagnosed when you were quite young, correct? I was diagnosed when I was quite young, but my mother didn't uh, – like. So me and my brother were tested. Mm. I was diagnosed with learning difficulties and ADHD. And my brother was also diagnosed with ADHD. But for some reason, the focus on me was my learning difficulties. And the focus Mm. on my brother was his ADHD. And what we've come to understand and learn through uh, further research is that it just presents differently in men and women. So my ADHD was not really supported. Um, at that time, whereas my brother got medication quite early on because he was the more hyperactive one. Mm. And I've actually just more recently uh, been working with my doctor to do another diagnosis. And it was interesting because she reviewed all that paperwork from when I was 12. And then she did some additional testing with me. <laughs> and I didn't even know there was two, there's two different types of ADHD. 
Mm-hmm. What are, do you know the two types off the top? Yeah, of so so you've got like ADD, so attention deficit disorder, and then you've got um, uh, what is it called? Atten- ADHD, so hyperactive and all of that. Yeah, but, but then you've more got about, yeah. yeah, but then you've got like um, well, you've got one that's what hyper. Like- hyper yeah. and then you've got one that's inattentive i'm yes. pretty sure yeah. yeah so she uh she looked at me and she's like yep you have adhd in fact you have both forms of ADHD. yeah you can <laughs> be that you can be that punch. <laughs> yes 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 and i'm sort of like how does that work you know yeah. um well but how I- does that work actually so so what so obviously for me i'm very on the hyperactive side but mm-hmm. So with you being inattentive as well, how does that work out of curiosity? I don't really know. I feel like I don't even fully understand it myself, but I think it'll just be normal for you. It'll just be normal. My hyperactivity, I felt like was more contained to my mind Mm -hmm. in the sense that my, my thoughts were nonstop. They would just constantly be rushing and going and it was really hard for me to slow my mind down Mm. um and that led to um self-medicating with marijuana Mm. which is you know why we see a lot of adhd people so you're able to just go and buy that from the dispensers over there now correct oh it says it says common as a starbucks coffee shop or a liquor store it they are everywhere and is it like, cause like I like I remember when I went to Amsterdam. It's the same type of thing, right? Like, what is it? it have you have you ever heard of Amsterdam? Oh, Amsterdam! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. There. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, I I found that when I went there, because it was controlled and everything, it was actually um, it was a great experience. It seemed yeah. like it was. Amsterdam it, it was yeah, and is it the same in Canada? Like it's really controlled and, you know, you can go in and go, hey, look, I'm looking for this here. And they're really intelligent people, know their Super stuff. Super intelligent, really knowledgeable. Like the displays are like a fancy store. Like it's it's not that hole-in-the-wall grungy. Like, no, everyone is like clean, proper, beautiful mm. displays. We've got a variety of different, you know, ways to smoke it like it's it's everywhere it's has it sort of has it like um because it's like legal there now and you've probably seen before it was when it was illegal and then it's legal now what are the changes that you've found out of it out of curiosity i don't know if i've noticed like a lot of like changes but i have noticed that a lot of People have gone California sober, I think is what they call it, is that people are actively choosing Mm -hmm. to smoke weed rather than drink. Instead Mm -hmm. of like adding it to the mix, they're going, oh, I would rather uh, Mm -hmm. smoke weed than -hmm. than drink. So maybe that would be my biggest difference. I think it was Mm -hmm. interesting because it really became legal during the pandemic. And Mm -hmm. suddenly this illegal substance was now an essential Product. product yeah so one of the very few things that could be open and operating during that time which mm. just goes to show you how much pain people were in mm. that we needed the liquor stores and these weed dispensaries to be open so that people could cope with how difficult these circumstances mm. were and i think mm. there's still people struggling with releasing those clutches Mm, yeah it was an interesting time like um i know here in australia so obviously australia's got a very big drinking culture Um, oh yeah y'all know how to do it (laughs) yeah 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 it's in our blood um you know literally um, well because it's so hot we just need to cool down oh, you know? oh that's what it is yeah you <laughs> know kills... just by the beach of course you need to crack a cold beer. exactly exactly <laughs> exactly but they actually had to put um limits on how much alcohol you were buying uh oh. during that um part because people were just every day going there and drinking and it was becoming a real big problem what were the limits um, oh i can't I remember, remember no. now maybe it might have been like a bottle it, depending on what you were buying maybe you're only able to buy one card and a beer for example but you, what you could probably have done is buy one card and a beer 
gone to another bottle shop, yeah. buy it, brought another one, if that's really what you wanted to do. Yeah. Not that I was sitting at home drinking. The, to tell you the truth, it was it was difficult and I was like, there is no way I'm going to sit here and drink all the time because my wife, she was on the front line doing all the testing and that for COVID and all of that, but I was at home on my own the whole time. Yeah. So it was just like... I was on my own. So drinking on your own is not a good thing. Yeah. No, don't recommend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. To- so we sort of went off a little bit off topic there, but we're talking about ADHD, um, all of that. Out of curiosity, right? Um, and I, it's really interesting when we speak about relationships and, you know, growing as people. How have you found that? Um, as you've sort of developed into an adult and all of that, um, you know, because I think for myself, I've especially now I'm uh, being diagnosed, I look mm-hmm. at a lot of relationships before I married my wife um, and it's sort of like, wow, a lot of the things that were maybe some of the problems were contributed to my ADHD, if that makes oh, interesting. sense. interesting. And so by relationships, you mean romantic relationships? Well, it probably could be both. It could be like friendships with, you know, Mm -hmm. like, you know, like I wouldn't even say that I've got like lots of old friends who I still are in contact with, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. It's, but it's not to say that I hate them. No, no, no. It might be more. Yeah, I might need to change. I'll be like, okay, well, that's that. I'm going to go do this now and maybe I forget about them. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's just interesting when I speak to other neurodivergent people on these mm-hmm. types of things. I do find it's helpful in relationships to kind of make aware of certain things that you need. Like, for example, um, I get distracted really easily mm-hmm. and people could – receive that as oh you don't care Mm. when it's it's and you know just understanding that it's an impulsive thing that feels really difficult to explain it's not that I don't care Mm. um but I'll just need your patience in bringing me back in or understanding that if we're in a crazy environment it's much harder for me to stay zoned in um for me my learning difficulties it's hard for me to retain information too so um partners feeling like I didn't care because I didn't remember and, you know, relaying that, that it's not an intentional thing. And I am present. It's just that I do struggle to retain certain information. And can I say on that, right. What I've found in the past, exactly similar type of stuff. And then when I say, look, I really struggled that almost causes fights. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like, no, nah, you just don't care. They, some yeah. people, unless you're ADHD. And then maybe those people just aren't for us then. You know, we do. Yeah, well, yeah, help. yeah, yeah, totally. You know, we need people who are going to be a little bit more patient or understanding or or willing to learn how different our brains might work and how they mm. can best support us in that. And there's actually like, I, there's so many great like TikToks and Instagrams now that really focus on ADHD in relationships. They've got lots of great advice for partners of those who are ADHD. So highly recommend giving that a quick Google or a swipe through because there, there are certain ways in which to best love us or understand. Well, I, and I think as well, like if I think back to some of my past relationships, when I was with people and I think they wanted to try change who I was you know, and it's like, Mm-mm. I just can't. Like, my brain is. We're not is, supposed to. Yeah, not I'm not to. wired to. I'm not wired to be able to focus at dinner if I've got a million things going on in my brain. Sure. There. And it was it was actually interesting because the guest we had on the podcast last, he was actually talking about something similar where his kids would come home. And he would be, his brain would just be going a million Mm. miles an hour and he'd be staring off and the kids are talking and and they'd be like, Dad, you just don't care. You're not interested in what is like, I actually do care. It's just I'm really trying to, it's hard for me to focus 
because I'm thinking about this thing and you're telling me this thing here. But also even just what you said of just looking off. I had this conversation mm. uh, just the other day with a fellow ADHD -er of how sometimes our best way to listen is through not looking at you. Like in school, mm. doodling, like scribbling on sheets of paper and we're, we're digesting. Like there's, even when I'm watching TV, I'm usually in a coloring book. There's that that need to have my attention in multiple places in order to best pay attention, if that makes it's, sense. It's, yeah, yeah. It's funny, right? Because let's say I put something on um, Netflix or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? And my wife will be like, you're not even watching this. You're on your phone. And oh I'm God, like, I actually, I actually am watching yeah. it. I mm -hmm. need this other distraction to mm -hmm. sort of like, fill the void of something's not right here if that makes sense yeah 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 absolutely i think so. and i and i think as well like you promise and i gotta admit like being on my phone is almost like an addiction for me but it's it's like it for fills a lot of in. people yeah it fills in yeah. that um uh, time when I just need that, if that yeah. makes sense. I totally, and this is not to um, shame you for that because I am absolutely guilty for it myself, but mm -hmm. I wonder how much of our ability to focus for everyone, even if you are neurotypical, how mm -hmm. much uh, our ability to focus is weakening because of things like, or apps like TikTok or Instagram, where you can scroll through so much so you're so quickly that your need to pay attention mm -hmm. is um, isn't as, long as it used to be so now we're just used to some of these quicker buttons. yeah yeah it's interesting it's definitely interesting so you know you said a little bit about this at the beginning so what was your experience trying medication so try medication so you have been on it or you're not on it anymore, yeah, i've or? only been on it for three weeks now a so month. you weren't even on it when you were like diagnosed no i was like I, like i said like my brother was the one who got the medication mm. and it was kind of dismissed and when i brought it up later in life most recently when i was because i was just working on my doc with my doctor from it and i asked for those papers those those tests from my mother yeah. she's like you don't have adhd i don't remember them ever diagnosing you with that like i don't think you have it and sure enough it's like literally all over the paperwork mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it just wasn't a focus so i'm grateful that my doctor was open to prescribing me medicine because it really has been a game changer for myself yeah. and um for anyone who's listening who might struggle with the idea of taking medicine to help in this mind because i I know for myself and for a lot of people I speak to, there's a stigma of like mm. feeling like something's really wrong if you need to yeah. take medicine to fix that. But it's really like some people need glasses to see mm. and it doesn't mean they're broken or wrong. They just need a bit of help. And mm. for those of us with ADHD, there's a chemical imbalance in our mind. And this little piece of medicine just helps keep everything um, connected or flowing the way it needs to be. Mm. And for me, what that felt like or what that feels like now is everything feels so much quieter. Like I mentioned earlier that I um, was self-medicating with marijuana for a period of time. And that's mm -hmm. because that medicine would quiet the noise in my my brain. Mm -hmm. And that, that weed would quiet the noise. I could finally like shut down. And that's kind of what this medicine is giving me it's this my brain just whew, it's calm it's quieter I can actually focus on one thing um I used to have to stand up during meetings I'd have to get up and walk around my office multiple times in a day like I can't even I don't even know I'd lose count of how many times I would just get up do a walk around the office and come back to my desk because I had that need to move now mm. I can sit at my desk and just zone in and um, I can go out for drinks with my girlfriends and actually focus on what they're talking about. On what they're about. talking about. I had I went out for drinks with my for my girlfriend's birthday soon after starting the medicine, and I walked away from that bar being like, "Oh my god, I wasn't distracted at all. I was present. I was there." And it mm -hmm. it's really helped me immensely. And I'm I'm actually very grateful to my doctor and the medicine because it's it has been a game changer for me. No, that's awesome. Do you know what, right? It, it, it's interesting how you spoke about it quiet in your brain because I've had some friends who have said 
it's quiet in my brain, but I I don't like that. And they've mm. actually got an off the medication because they were like they want it depend and it yeah. can sometimes maybe you depend know. on what the person does for a job. Um, you know, it was they said it like took their creativity away. So they they just didn't feel it worked for them type of thing. And I think it is. There's nothing wrong with um, being on it or not being on it. I think it's definitely an individual It's choice. a personal choice. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. There's also a variety of different medications. So if mm-hmm. one doesn't work for you, talking to mm-hmm. your doctor and seeing if maybe it's because you are better suited to a different version. Mm-hmm. Um, what was I also going to say about that? The quieting of the brain. Oh, this is my thing. I'd be curious to know how much time they gave to the medicine because for my first week on this medicine and a girlfriend of mine did it at the same time as me and stopped immediately because she didn't like it Mm. because around that first week, you do feel high. Like Mm. that first week I was on it, I kind of felt like I was microdosing some kind of drug and I was having this like a bit of a euphoric but I think it's because the chemicals were just mm. kind of getting straight in my mind but now that I've been doing it consistently for three weeks it you it's like taking a vitamin there's no high experience it feels it's very just normal, normal. Like, for yeah. that first week it definitely felt like oh I feel high I feel in a weird zone during that and that stopped my friend from continuing so I've had to like go mm. to her and be like just dedicate yourself to one week and just see See if you can like it when the high wears off. Wow, crazy, crazy, crazy. Are, now, I you, ask, are you on medication? No, no, no. So I did when I didn't need medication. So when I got diagnosed, um, the doctor was like, no, you don't, you know. So so what happened with me, and this is what the doctor said to me when she diagnosed me, was that so I'm what they class as twice exceptional. I don't know if you've ever heard the term before. Wait, I think we talked about this on my podcast, but yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we might have actually. Mm-hmm. And um, she said because it was so late when I got diagnosed, because I even remember as like when I was younger, especially in work and that, I'd be very bad at like organising and all of that. Oh, but, yeah. Man, I can do that no problems now. And what she said was that what has happened, my brain has pretty much rewired itself Mm. with these coping mechanisms and I'm able to deal with it without that medication type of thing. Mm. Don't get me wrong, I still do have issues with certain things, but um, I'm aware of what the triggers are, all of that. And so, for example, if I was to go to a busy shopping centre, I just can't, I I can do it, but it's just very overwhelming for me. So Mm -hmm. I try to go in, you know, periods where it's not so busy. Don't get me wrong. There might be some times where I do need to go to them in a busy period, but I'll, and, but I'll deal with it type of thing. So um, that's what sort of worked for me. Um, So now I I have it. Like for knowing, knowing what you need to care for yourself. You know, well, yeah, yeah, it's been interesting because now that I've got the diagnosis, all of that, I'm able to understand what those triggers were, mm-hmm. and it, it 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 has been. It's been like, oh, now I know why I was feeling this way when I was doing this, um, and it's it's been a lot better. Nice, nice. I'm happy for you. Yeah, no, nah, no, nah, it it is pretty cool. But, um, look, we are getting towards the end here, but what advice would you give to others similar to yourself? I think what I hear is shame or a stigma from my friends who who have ADHD or um, feeling like something's wrong with them. And mm-hmm. I think I just want to say to anyone who does have it, that it's kind of like your superpower. Um, and one of my favorite things about it is that it's really hard for us to give an F about things we don't care about. Mm-hmm. It keeps us out of working jobs. We don't care about in relationships. We don't care about. It's like this gift where you just have to do things that are joyful to you. And I just think that's amazing. And again, what you said, you know, our ability to connect and empathize um, is also a gift. And so just ensuring that 
no matter what the world tells you you're capable of or um, that you're stupid or anything, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Not like people don't know you like you know yourself. And this is a gift. And just know that there's nothing, nothing to be ashamed about. Yeah, it's interesting. I've sort of found when now, especially with a lot of the work I'm doing in this space, um, the amount of people I attract um, in regards to other neurodivergent people Mm -hmm. um, and how quickly we have, like, build a friend. Like, like this is the second time I've sort of chatted with you, Jess, Mm -hmm. and, like, but I feel like I, I feel quite comfortable talking to you. And if I was to go to Canada, I'm sure we could probably, maybe we could go to one of the dispensaries. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I wish we could go to a dispensary so quick. And we'd go to, like, yeah. Trinity Bell Wits Park and just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could go to a, yeah, we could <laughs> go to a dispensary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what, right? You know what? And I don't know if it's an ADHD thing. When I when I smoke weed, right? I you know you see some people and they're like comatose, like yeah, like that. Yeah. For me, when I smoke, I'm like bah, 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 bah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Not that I smoke heaps of it anymore. Well, I have but, a feeling uh, that you're just a talker in general. I don't know. I am. I, am. I, am. I feel like you could talk to anyone. You could talk forever. And it, it's I know our time is coming close to an end, but I recently went on a date with someone who is also ADHD. Yeah. And it was really funny getting home afterwards and reflecting on that date because we were both ADHD. So it, it was like we had 50 different conversations, but completed none of them. Like we were just jumping oh. around so much when, <laughs> and I. Well, I did you, did, was it a good day? It was a good day. Yeah, it was a good day. Oh, we'll gonna date have again. another one. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right. See, that's the thing. Sometimes, um, you know, when you're connected with other neurodivergent people, it's like you have this connection there. You yeah. know, I know with my wife, her and I, like is her she, and is I, she, is she neurodivergent? No, well, yeah, she's neurodivergent. She's not ADHD okay. or dyslexic. Completely different, but it works. Say, eh? it's yeah. like we balance each other out, type of thing. Sounds like is, a perfect marriage. Yeah, it's funny because like. The saying opposites attract really is true. Like we are completely <laughs> different. Yeah. Like so like she is she like she'll talk a lot with me, but yeah, she's not she's not a she's an introvert and I'm the extrovert if that but I can be introverted at times as well. It just oh, yeah, we all depends have on the situation, you know. But yeah. you know, getting to the end here, you know, if uh, people want to connect with you and find out a little bit more about your work. Mm -hmm. Um, where can they go to connect with you? Well, please add me on LinkedIn. If you're watching this there, I would love to connect with you on a professional level. But if you want to connect with me elsewhere, I'm very active on social media. You can find me at coached.byjess on Instagram or at coachedbyjess on TikTok. I'm very active on both those platforms. And I would love to hear from you. Shoot me a DM, say that you listened to this interview. Um, And yeah, that's where you can find me. Legend, legend, legend. So you're off to, to go see your mates now, is that correct? Yeah, it's like a little girls' night, catching up, watch the movies, maybe. We'll see. We always say that, but then we never stop talking enough to actually do that. So Yeah, yeah. Well, you have a few <laughs> drinks or something? Probably, but I'm more of a gardener these days. <laughs> a gardener? So it was just with the, bottle, with the thing of water, it looks like a cocktail, like a... Long Island, uh, what do they call it? Yes. A long yeah, it looks like a cocktail thing. No, it's just I got this at a girlfriend's bachelorette party. It's just like a little water bottle. I'm not drinking on the podcast, I promise. Uh, I, oh, look, you could have. I wouldn't have judged you or anything. Like we have, I've sat here and had some drink. Not well. It's it's eleven. And, it's almost twelve here in in Australia right now. So yeah. um, I could have had a glass of wine if I wanted to, but you could have. I wouldn't have judged it. But I've sat <laughs> on here and had some wines before. But um, <laughs> no. But Jess, thank you so much for coming on. It's been really great to connect with you. I wanted yeah. to get you on earlier, but just with the time differences and that, it's just been Your timing really is perfect. Difficult. I wouldn't have tried the medicine yet, so it honestly yeah. it all worked out to to be the right timing. Everything happens for a reason. So thank you so much for having me. It's been a great combo. No problem. No problem. And for anyone who hasn't already done so, if you have, um, 
If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe, like, and follow to all of our social media platforms. Check us out on anywhere where you check out your podcast. My name's Will Wheeler, and this is Neurodivergent Mates. Till next time. (laughs) 